righteousness. John chapter 8 teaches that if the Son makes us free, we are free indeed. And the book of Hebrews teaches that we have a high priest. We have a high priest in heaven who can cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. This is so significant, uh, the fact that this is a modern statement, not an ancient statement, that the church does still support the idea and its highest officials that uh, actually our own suffering or good deeds can lessen our time in purgatory. The idea being that purgatory is our atonement for sin. That somehow in purgatory through suffering for hundreds or thousands or millions of years that eventually we will be privileged to enter into eternal life through our own suffering rather than by the sufferings of Christ. Now, now the churches, the Protestant churches, James, uh, have not traditionally agreed with this view of salvation and the whole Protestant Reformation was founded upon salvation by grace through faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we're seeing some changes take place. We are, Ty. It's unbelievable because indulgences was one of the main issues that Luther brought up when that separation took place mm -hmm. with the church. But recently we read an article from Time Magazine that says, quote, Lutherans and Catholics reach agreement on the issue that once split rest Western Christianity in two. This is time July 6, 1998, and it's on the doctrine of justification by faith. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing here is in spite the fact that the Catholic Church has not changed, neither looks like it will change, according to conservative Catholics, that they will not allow indulgences to be forgotten just for the sake of ecumenism, that even though they haven't changed, Lutherans are changing, Protestants are changing, and they are coming over and accepting that we believe the same thing on justification by faith, even though there has been no change in the teaching of the Catholic Church. Now, the Bible, friends, clearly teaches without any apology, without any hesitation, in Romans 3, verse 20, therefore, by the deeds of the law, shall no flesh be justified in God's sight. The justification that we have is through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Our salvation is built upon the firm and strong foundation of His shed blood in our behalf. This is why Paul said he determined not to know anything among those to whom he preached save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And that's our message as Christians at this last tail in part of human history, to exalt Christ as all sufficient for our salvation, to point people to the everlasting gospel and to settle each person who will hear into an, a total dependence on the merits of Christ for salvation. In fact, Ty, Paul was so strong on this in the book of Romans. He was so strong on the gospel and preaching faith alone through Jesus Christ alone that he brought up a question because he knew people would question him. In verse 31, he says, Do we then make void the law through faith? And he answers the question, God forbid, yea, we establish the law. And I would like to suggest, friends, that unless we are preaching the true gospel, we will not be questioned. In other words, when the true gospel is preached as Paul preached it, that question will arise. Are we doing away with the law? Are we doing away with obedience? Because Paul was so strong on the true gospel, he was questioned about whether or not he was doing away with the law of God. And we are teaching a gospel that's so powerful that that question may arise in your hearts and in your minds. But the fact of the matter is, the Bible teaches that the law of God is established by the preaching of the true gospel. Amen. And we want to notice also the final aspect brought to view here, friends, of the everlasting gospel in the first angel's message. We've noted the whole message, fear God, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and here's the final part, and worship Him that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. Here is a call to worship the only true God, the Creator, and here we have found in a previous study together that we have a direct link, actually a direct quote from the fourth commandment that commands that we should keep holy the seventh day Sabbath. Now we find, friends, that not only has the papal church, the Babylon brought to view in the second angel's message, uh, taught contrary to the everlasting gospel in all these other respects, but now we find also in the Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine by Stephen Keenan these words concerning the Sabbath day of God. Question. Have you any other way of proving that the church has power to institute festivals of precept? Answer, 
Had she not such power, she could not have done that in which all modern religionists agree with her. She could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day of the week, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. Question, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea, A.D. 364, transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Here we have a clear statement from the official catechism of the church that the Sabbath has been changed from Saturday to Sunday by the authority of the Catholic Church, not by biblical authority. All of these points are clearly revealing the identity of Babylon. And you can see that Babylon is going to fall when the everlasting gospel is mm -hmm. preached. You can see the contrast between the two so clearly as we study the Bible together and as we see these authoritative statements come to the forefront now as we live in the time just before the second coming of Jesus Christ. And it is our prayer, it's our hope, friends, that as you're listening mm -hmm. to these clear biblical truths that you will take your stand to come out of Babylon and take a hold of the everlasting gospel in all its fullness. Don't go away. We'll be back in just a minute. Hi, I'm Reese Rafferty. If you're like me and millions of others, you want to know what God has to say to our present generation. Well, you don't have to guess. Revelation 14 records God's special message to our world today. It is an extremely significant message because it prepares all who believe it for the second coming of Christ. This is why James and Ty have produced this series of programs on Revelation 14. They've also prepared a complimentary set of study guides to help you dig deeper into this vital message. The entire set of outlines are yours absolutely free. Call us at 1-877-585-1111 or write to Light Bears Ministry Nalo, Washington, 99150. Or you may email your request to lbm at televar, T-E-L-E-V-A-R dot com. Ask for the Revelation 14 study guides. In today's study, we've looked at the first and second angel's messages of Revelation chapter 14, and we've noticed a very simple and beautiful pattern. The first angel's message brings to view the everlasting gospel, the true gospel of Jesus Christ. The second angel's message warns of the false gospel, false teachings promoted by a false system of worship that has set itself up in rivalry against the kingdom of God. The third angel's message that we'll be considering in future studies brings to view the final conflict between these two opposing messages, these two opposing systems of worship. We're looking forward to studying that with you at that time. We hope that your hearts have been touched and drawn as Jesus Christ has been lifted up mm -hmm. through the everlasting gospel. We want to encourage you to send for those free study outlines so that you can study in more detail some of the points that we've covered here mm -hmm. and in previous lessons. And we want to hear from you. We would be very encouraged to get your letters, to hear from you by phone, and to receive your comments and questions. So be sure and get in contact with us. And until next time, God bless.